everyone for coming out tonight. It's wonderful to see the familiar faces, and it's also exciting to see all the new faces that are here. For those of you that it's your first time here, welcome very much. Thank you for coming, and you're very welcome to be here, and we hope you have an enjoyable evening. For those of you that are here consistently with us over the course of our entire lecture series, thank you for being our supporters. Without you guys, we couldn't be here. We would not serve our mission. So thank you to all of our members. Thank you to all of our people that come on a weekly basis. We're very excited to see you here tonight. We have an extraordinary program that you're going to hear tonight, and we hope that you tell all of your friends about it because there's two more sessions to our fall lecture series that are going to be just as exciting as tonight. As we always do, we begin every program here at the Silver Sides with the Pledge of Allegiance. So everyone please stand so that we can say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, is always and first and foremost is to honor our veterans. And we do that here by preservation of our artifacts. As which you look outside, you can see our wonderful submarine, our Coast Guard cutter, and you look around the building, all the wonderful artifacts that we have here. The other part of how we serve our mission is through education. And all of you that are here realize that education, no better way to honor a veteran than to let them know that their service mattered. Tonight in the audience, we have many, many veterans and we appreciate the service that you've done for this country. No matter which conflict you were involved in, we appreciate it and thank you very much. Tonight, <laughs> we also are necessary in this community to have our sponsors. Tonight's program is sponsored in part by the Center for Experiential Learning at Muskegon Community College. Without support of our community and without support of all of our members like you, we could not bring you all of this wonderful programming. So a big round of applause for tonight's sponsor. Our lecture series for the fall is almost finished. We have two more sections of on here. Next week we will be talking about the end of the Cold War. Ron Janowski will be back again, and he will give us another wonderful presentation on the end of the Cold War. And then our final part of this fall lecture series will be a wrap-up, and that will be provided by Bill Jacobs. And Bill has done an extraordinary job and gone back and looked at over 6,000 years of war and conflict and put them into different categories where we can see so many of the things that we've talked about how the ends of wars have influenced future conflicts all the way across the board, how all the ends of wars across the board for the last 6,000 years have influenced some of the conflicts that we even speak of now. So I hope you continue to join us for our next two weeks. Tonight's speaker comes to us from Chicago. And um, in addition to speaking tonight on Divided on D-Day, he will be speaking at Muskegon Community College tomorrow evening on the quarter line, out on the campus on quarter line in the Stevenson Center at 6 p.m. And he's going to be discussing a completely different topic. And he will be talking about future jobs and how our society and our community can benefit from those and what is necessary in our own society. We're looking forward to seeing so many of you there as well. Um, additionally, after our speaker tonight, Mr. Go Dr. Gordon speaks, There'll be a book signing downstairs in the lobby. Any of you that wish to purchase books, the gift shop will stay open until after our presentation this evening, and books will be available to purchase. And Dr. Gordon will be down in the lobby signing books for you after our question and answer period. Let me tell you a little bit about this extraordinary man that came out tonight to speak to us. Dr. Gordon is a professional historian. He's a researcher, a writer, and a speaker. For 20 years, period, he has taught history courses at DePaul University and also business subjects at Loyola University and Northwestern University. Dr. Gordon is a member of the American Historical Association 
and was a participant in the Distinguished Lecture Program at the Organization of American Historians. He is the author or co-author of 19 books and has written over 300 articles in journals and trade publications. He has researched for a period of over 15 years all the information that is going into tonight's lecture. And so without further ado, we will bring up Dr. Gordon. Thank you, Peggy. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon a great crusade for which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. These were the words of General Dwight D. Eisenhower on the morning of June the 6th as 150,000 Allied soldiers from many countries hurled themselves at Fortress Europe. This is the story of the leadership that planned, implemented, and then fought that campaign. Co-authored by David Ramsey, whose father was the Admiral of the D-Day fleet, it is the first Anglo-American history of Normandy that's ever been published. So, well, well, I'm afraid your clicker is not working for some reason. There we go. All right, let's go back one. This is General Frederick Morgan. General Morgan, General Morgan was the British officer who implemented the plan, who made the initial plan for the Normandy invasion. But you should know that the Allies worked on the plan for Normandy starting in 1942. In fact, the Americans wanted to invade France in 1942. Marshall and Admiral King, George, General George Marshall, head of the Joint Chiefs, and Admiral King went to England and got Churchill's to agree. The only problem was we didn't have the troops, nor did we have the ships. You, the LST that's right down here, we needed hundreds of those to make these invasions, and we didn't have hundreds of those in 1942. So the British told them, no, we're not going to do it. 1943, the Americans wanted the invasion. The British instead said, no, why don't we continue the invasion of North Africa? Because remember, in 1942, they invaded Torch. And then Sicily, Husky. So finally, in 1942, at the end, Stalin asked Churchill and Roosevelt, when are you going to do this invasion? Remember, the Russians lost 20 million people in the Second World War. And they wanted a second front. So finally, the Allies, particularly the British, were shamed into agreeing to an invasion. They had their plan called Rankin, which was to encircle Europe, closing the circle, bomb the Germans, let the Russians bleed them to death, and use guerrilla warfare and the underground movement. And then when the Nazis are tottering, then let the uh, Allies invade. The Russians had this joke that the Allies would invade Europe, and when the Russians got to the English Channel, they'd hold up a big sign to the Allies, it's safe now for you to invade. <laughs> so Morgan started the plan with a group of American and British officers. And they had an old code name for the invasion called Roundup. Well, that was discarded, and they had to come up with a new code word. So he sent one of his officers to come up with a proper sounding code word that they assigned to each of these invasions. Well, he came back, and he said the only code word available was mothball. Well, uh, you know, at that time, they had in Europe and the Pacific many operations being done. And that was the only word available. But Morgan knew that Churchill was not going to be interested. And Churchill had given Morgan a deadline of August 1st, 1943, to submit the invasion plan for Normandy. So he went to see him. And he told him that the 
code word was mothball. Churchill went right through the roof. What do you mean that the great invasion of northwestern Europe would be called mothball? Do you expect the veterans to be telling their grandchildren that we brought down the Nazis with mothball? If they can't come up with a better code word, I will come up with it. So he sat back chewing his cigar and he said, I have it, Overlord. We will call it Overlord. That was probably the greatest contribution that Winston Churchill made to Overlord in all his tenure as prime minister because he too was afraid that the British, they had never defeated the Germans in Northwestern Europe, that they weren't up to the task. And also remember, the British recruited more men proportionally from their, uh, from their population than any of their other allies. And they were running out of troops. They had lost over 700,000 men in World War I, and the French over a million. And during the Second World War, it will interest you to know that the French civilian population suffered heavier casualties from bombing than the British. And the bombing was our bombing of France that killed many of them. So there is Overlord. There is the plan that they came up with. And let's now take a look at the men behind the plan. These are the commanders. Let's go from left to right. First is General Bradley. General Bradley had been Patton's deputy commander in North Africa and Sicily. He now is the ground commander. After Patton had slapped those children in Sicily, he lost the role he would have had as the commander of the US Army in Normandy. And Bradley took over. Bradley was very reluctant to have Patton because he thought he had these impulses that he wouldn't be able to control. But Eisenhower said, we need him for the offensive, for the breakout. Next to him is Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey. Now this man, you don't know. This is the man that wrote Neptune, which is the invasion plan. He is the father of my co-author, Bertram Ramsey, who is the author of a book on the Lusitania and on the founding of the British Secret Service. Ramsey also wrote the amphibious plan for the invasion of North Africa and for the invasion of Sicily. So he was the man to write these amphibious plans. He died, unfortunately, in a plane accident right before the end of the war, flying to Montgomery's headquarters. His plane crashed. So he never wrote his memoirs. So that's why you don't know about him very much. Uh, next in command of the 7,000 ship invasion fleet and all the logistical delivery of all the supplies to all the Allied troops for the remaining part of the war because they all had to come by sea. Then you have Sir Arthur Tedder. He was the deputy supreme commander. He had been commander of all of the air forces in the Mediterranean during the reign, the time period when Eisenhower had run the North African campaign. So he was a good friend of uh, Eisenhower. And next you have General Eisenhower. Remember, he started the war as a colonel. Eisenhower never commanded any troops in the field. He was a staff officer. He was the one that, at the end of uh, World War I, drove t uh, trucks and tanks across the United States. And he was the one, in the end, it was president, was, that came up with the idea of an interstate uh, transportation system as a result of that. Next to him is General Sir Bernard R Montgomery, the commander of the British Army and the temporary ground commander made by Eisenhower before the invasion. He was the hero of El Alamein and according to him he was the greatest general since Wellington. <laughs> Next was uh, Chief Air Marshal Tafford Lee Mallory who was the commander of the Allied Air Forces. Uh, after he helped to displace the commander of Fighter Command after the Battle of Britain, he commanded all of the Fighter Command. He was not well liked by any of the Allied airmen. But again, because he had experience, Eisenhower put him in command of the Allied forces, Air Forces. And next is Lieutenant General Beale Smith. He was Eisenhower's chief of staff. He had been Eisenhower's chief of staff in the Mediterranean. 
And then finally, as the bottom picture, of course, is good old blood and guts himself, Lieutenant General George S. Patton, who would play a major role in the Overlord campaign by commanding the Third Army. So there is the Overlord plan as it was written, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, it didn't quite work out the way they thought it would, as we're going to see in a moment. Oh, sorry. Let's go back. So here is Eisenhower and Bertram Ramsey. This is the headquarters, Southwark Park, right uh, near Plymouth, where the invasion fleet was going to leave. Now, Ramsey wrote this book, Operation Neptune. This is the amphibious assault plan. It was extremely successful. Only one ship was lost on D-Day, and that ship in a mine off Omaha Beach. Now, Ramsey suspected that the Germans would attack this huge convoy of 7,000 ships that includes all the landing craft, like the LSTs, but the smaller ones too. When they got halfway across the channel, they would be attacked. So that bad weather that you always see and hear about that delayed the invasion was actually a gift because the Germans didn't have any air reconnaissance. They didn't have any e-boats in the channel because they thought the storm was too bad and the Allies would never come. So in a way, that bad weather played a major role in the success of Ramsey's plan. However, in the plan, he also said it was very necessary that the Allies had to have a port. That's why they had chosen Normandy because of Shoreburg and some of the other ports. They had to have a major port because when you land an invasion, you have to have supplies. Logistics would prove to be the Achilles heel of overlord. And he also said they had to have Antwerp as an operating port before they could invade Germany, or they would not have the supplies to do it. And he was right, as you will see. So now here is Hitler planning Fortress Europe. Until 1942, the Germans didn't have any plan to defend Europe. Because remember, they had, they had thought they would take Britain in 1940. Hitler then diverted his attention by invading the Soviet Union in the June of, of 1941. They thought that would be a three or four month campaign and the Soviet Union would fall like a rotten apple. Didn't quite work out that way. Uh, in fact, in the end, it helped to destroy uh, Nazi Germany. So, in 1942, he began a serious plan to actually defend Europe. General Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt. Rundstedt had commanded the armies that helped conquer France in six weeks in 1940. What the Germans couldn't do in four years in 1941 in six weeks, they defeated the French army that was bigger than the German army, had heavier tanks than the German army, and actually uh, they outnumbered the Germans with the, with the small British expeditionary force. He then commanded troops in Russia, in southern Russia. He allowed some of them to retreat. Hitler sacked him, and then he reappointed him the commander of the West. And his concept was to stop the Allies. They would have a central panzer reserve of all these panzer divisions. And once the Allies landed, the Germans would counterattack with their armor. With him was Field Marshal Oren Rommel. Rommel had been Hitler's military attaché or assistant uh, for the invasion of Poland. He commanded the 7th Armored Division. He was the first to get to the English Channel for the invasion of France. He was then sent to North Africa and he came very close to taking Suez, but not quite. After the debacle in North Africa, he then was assigned by Hitler to be an inspector general reporting directly to Hitler, and then uh, for the West Wall, which they called the West Wall, or Fortress Europe, Festung Europa, as the Germans called it. Uh, he also, ultimately, was in command of the 7th Army. The 7th Army group was around Pas-de-Calais and Normandy. Pas-de-Calais is the narrowest part of the channel. That's where the Germans thought the Allies would land because they would get better fighter cover 
for uh, that part of the coast. His idea was directly opposed to Rundstedt's because in North Africa he had experienced Allied air power. His panzer divisions and tanks and equipment had been smashed at the end. And he believed that if the Germans attempted to counterattack, the Allied air power once again would smash the German panzer units. He was correct. Instead, he proposed to build, to build defenses along the coast and deploy not panzer divisions, but packets of tanks right behind the beach. So once the Allied troops landed and they were engaged, then the tanks would come on the beach, mix in with the Allied soldiers, so the, the, the ships could not bombard them and destroy the Allies. That was his, his concept. Well, there is the German dispositions in the west. You will notice how there's a huge concentration. The most powerful Germans are right here at Petit Calais. Here is Normandy. A lot of these were in the wrong place. And here is this Panzer Reserve. It was around Paris. It's too far away. The Atlantic Wall was a monstrous fortification. 15,000 strong points, 250,000 men. They used a, a million tons of steel. They poured 20 million yards of concrete. They deployed 50,000 anti-tank obstacles. This is a steel spider wet trap with mines on it. Anti-tank barriers, hedgehogs, twisted steel to rip apart, landing craft. Four million mines were planted. And of course, behind that were 60 German divisions seven panzer divisions and 1,600 tanks. Well, here is D-Day, June 6, 1941, the 1,451st day of the German occupation of France and of Europe. And the first troops, of course, to hit right after midnight were two American and one British paratroop division they plunged out of the airplanes, landing on the flanks, attempting to seize the crossways that the Germans had flooded all this land behind the beaches. They attempted to seize these crossways so the Germans could not send reinforcements. And on the other flank, the back, on the other flank here, strategic bridges. Because the key to the entire invasion was this city of Kong. All the roads lead to come. This is all hedgerow country. This is all swamps, hills, forests. South of Khan is wide open. If they took Khan, the Allies could deploy their massive numbers of tanks. Now, the German <coughs> tank could not hold up against the Tiger. But for every one Tiger, we had a thousand Shermans. And with complete air power, we would overwhelm them and make all these defenses useless. The Germans would have to just retreat. So the idea was to take Khan on the first day. That was the objective. And that was, that was Montgomery's principal piece of his plan. It says 44 there. Yes, 1944. Yes, 1944. We'll have questions at the end. So the first speech, of course, uh, was Utah Beach. Let's go back. Okay, Utah Beach, and on that day, what happened was they landed in the wrong spot. In fact, if you go to Utah Beach, what you will find the spot they were supposed to land in was heavily fortified. They landed by accident in a gap in the German defenses. The reason why is the pilot boats that were guiding them in drifted. The current drifted and they landed in the wrong spot. Two of the pilot boats were sunk by the Germans and they landed at Utah Beach. Now, uh, General Roosevelt, who was the grandson of Teddy, or, or I'm sorry, the son of Teddy Roosevelt, he landed with the troops and he saw the mistake, but he said, we're not going to deviate. This is where the war starts, and they went from there. In fact, the greatest success 
on D-Day, after all this planning, was Utah Beach. That was the only beach that basically secured their objectives on the first day. And it was because it was a mistake. Now let's go to, well, there was Utah. Now we're going to go to Omaha Beach. Well, now Omaha Beach is in the middle. Let's take a look at this again. Let's go back. Here in the middle, here is Utah, and here's Gold, Juno, and Sword. Omaha Beach is one of the worst places in the world to land because it is a huge crescent amphitheater with bluffs 100 to 150 feet high. Why in the world were those idiots trying to land troops there? Well, take a look at it. Let's say they did If they just had Americans here and Brits here, what would happen? The Germans would concentrate here, and then they'd concentrate here, and that'd be the end of the invasion. They had to have Omaha Beach to link up a much broader bridgehead. The initial plan that Morgan wrote was for three beaches. Eisenhower and Montgomery said, no, we need five. We need a 50-mile wide landing zone so the Germans can't destroy the bridgehead. So Omaha Beach, the Germans had 75 millimeter guns, 35 pillboxes, 35 uh, uh, pillboxes, 88 75 millimeter guns, 60 a light and 35 small artillery pieces. They had 35 machine guns, 35 anti-tank guns, six mortar pits, 38 rocket pits, and four artillery positions. The defenses were manned by the 716th Coastal Division. Now, they were Slav and Polish so-called <coughs> volunteers. Mm. Many of them had been prisoners of war or enslaved labor, and the choice was you can join the wonderful German army or you could die here in slave labor. So many of them had been forced into the German army. A million non-Germans fought in the German army in the Second World War, some willingly, because there were uh, national, there were fascists in every Western European country, fascists, and there were divisions, French, Norwegian, etc. Now, however, Rommel got the 352nd Infantry Division moved from Russia to France and then to, to this beach. This was a hardened professional division. It lost a lot of men in Russia, but it had been rebuilt. However, most of the troops were not on the beach that day. The commander did not agree with Rommel's concept of stopping them at the beach, so he put most of the troops six miles inland. This is an important piece to keep in mind. When the Allies landed on D-Day, the Germans opened up with their machine guns. You've seen the movie Saving, how many of you have seen Saving Private Ryan? Raise your hands, all right. It was carnage. The Allied Admiral, an American Admiral, landed the tanks, they had amphibian tanks, maybe you know what I'm talking about, way too far out that day, seven, eight miles away from the beach. It was a choppy sea. Most of the tanks sank with all the men in them. Only two tanks got to the shore. The tanks were essential to help knock out the pillboxes. As the troops landed, many of the engineers who were there to deactivate all those mines you saw, etc., most of them were killed. The Allied bombardment should have been over an hour. It was only 45 minutes. The Allied Air Forces dropped their bombs. Either they were too short or they were too far. They killed more cows than they did German soldiers on D-Day with the bombing from the air. It was carnage. Luckily, Allied destroyers saw this, and they came in very close to the beach, scraping the bottom, and using hand signals with the troops on the ground who made it on the beach, they gradually worked and knocked out the German pillboxes. That day, Admiral Kirk, there is Admiral Kirk and Bradley, they seriously thought about withdrawing all the men from the beach and deploying them elsewhere. 
In the end, they didn't do it. And in the end, it's the heroism of individual soldiers and the Navy that saved the day on Omaha Beach. Of the 3,000 men who died, I'm sorry, the 5,000 men who died on D-Day, 3,000 died on Omaha Beach. It was a very close thing. If the Germans had all of the 352nd Infantry Division deployed as Rommel had wanted, Omaha would have failed. The invasion would have failed. Without Omaha Beach, the Germans would have been able to concentrate just on Utah and then on the three British beaches, and the invasion would have failed. They had to have Omaha Beach. It was very close. The British beaches, Gold, Juno, and Sword, on Gold Beach that day, the British landed in uh, rough seas, the 50th Infantry Division. The defenders were so-called Russian volunteers. They did, there was one strong point uh, that they took very quickly. By midday, they were five miles inland. And again, the topography was flat, and uh, therefore it was, they did not have the land obstacles that the Americans had. On Juneau Beach, this uh, was a Canadian beach, and this was revenge for the Canadians. At Dieppe, which was a practice invasion in 1942, many, many Canadians had been slaughtered. That's not what happened this time. The 2,400 uh, Canadians overwhelmed the 400 Germans. There was stiff resistance, but after three hours, they took the principal points and broke through inland. The key to this invasion was this beach, Sword Beach, because on that beach was deployed the, uh, Brit the British Armored Division that was to take Khan on the first day. Now, before the invasion, Montgomery learned that the Germans had successfully brought up a Panzer Division and it was right behind Khan. He never told any of his commanders. They knew nothing about it. He knew about this. He did not attempt to reinforce that division with more troops. So that division attacked. And unfortunately, unlike the Germans, the infantry element, tanks by themselves, cannot attack alone. They have to have infantry with them. And the infantry were held up at the beach. So they, they did not begin the attack until after 11 o'clock that day. Now what was happening with the Germans? Well, here is uh, the German 21st Panzer Division. Early in the morning, before 5 o'clock, they were alerted. The tanks were ready to roll. Hitler was asleep. And they could only roll if Hitler gave the command, because he was in charge of the strategic reserve. As a result, the, that Panzer Division sat there all day long. Finally, at 7 p.m., they were allowed to attack. And this is where they were going to attack. Right here. Here's Sword Beach. Here's Juno. There's a big hole. This, these are the German defenses. The Germans attack between these two to cause a wedge between them. If they had succeeded, again, the invasion might have failed in the long term. What happened? Well, the British advanced here to Khan. They ran into the Panzer Division, and they were stopped. They retreated back to this line. The Germans, only 85 German tanks, made it to the coast. And they linked up with the coastal troops. Now, at that time, what occurred at that time, at 8 o'clock at night, this huge armada of planes came over the Germans. And all these paratroopers started jumping out. Well, where the Germans were shot. How did they know they were going to be here? Instantaneous. But you see, they were reinforcing these troops over here on the other side of the river. They had nothing to do with this. But the Germans panicked. There were more German tanks coming up to reinforce. They all retreated. Big mistake. 
Because if they had kept the wedge between those beaches, again, the invasion would have been in jeopardy. So, what are the results? Well, Allied casualties, much lighter than predicted. Also, uh, well, you have 66, you have 12,000 casualties, 6,600 American, 3,500 British, 1,000 Canadian, uh, 156,000 American, British, and Canadian troops with some other smaller forces mixed in along a long front. However, Montgomery did not take Khan. Without Khan, the whole strategy for the invasion was in jeopardy. I'll explain that to you in a moment. Bradley admitted that during the invasion of D-Day that it was very close. Bradley didn't particularly like the Navy, but he said that they owed the Navy a great deal on D-Day because of what those destroyers did to save Omaha Beach. Well, here now is Sir Miles Dempsey, who was in command of the British Army, and Montgomery, who is the overall commander of the ground forces. Montgomery's principal plan was to take Khan on the first day, and then to, to be able to deploy the tremendous Allied armored forces, and for the Americans to pivot on Khan and break through and outflank the whole German army. Instead, what happened? Well, now the Germans held Khan, so he changed the plan. He never admitted that he changed the plan. During the whole campaign, he told people everything was going according to his plan. Wrong. His plan was not to have the Americans. Now, he said he would hold the German armor around Khan, and he allowed Americans to break through. Well, you're going to look at that in a moment, because that was never the plan, ever. Well, this is right afterwards they started the first of many efforts to try to take Khan. This is the second effort now. Here is Villas, village Bocage, and the British were going to outflank Khan. The airport is down here, and if they were able to outflank it again, the Germans would have to retreat out of Khan. So the British armor got there. The third British division, faced by the first panzer. There they are. They got there, they got through the village, and uh, there was a column of tanks and half-tracks, and they stopped. Because they were waiting for the infantry to catch up. In the meantime, a German officer who had a very small reserve of five Tiger tanks and one Mark tank, here he is, a Captain uh, Whitman, he saw this column of tanks, and he was screened by a hedgerow. Now, the hedgerows in Normandy are 10, 12 feet high. This is not a hedgerow like you think here. It's a nice little hedge. He took his 60-ton Tiger tanks, ran down that park, and he wiped out that whole column of British tanks. Then he went into the town and finished off those tanks. Later, he was repulsed because he got more tanks, but what happened was the British, let's just go back here a second, the British retreated back here. They didn't take Villas Bocage for 60 days. So, over a period of 42 days, the British would fight six battles before they took Khan. The whole invasion ground to a halt. And Miles Dempsey, you saw in a moment, he felt that the, the front had congealed, and now the British troops were very depressed. Many of these men had fought in North Africa, they had fought in Italy, many of them were worn out. And once again now, they were back to almost trench warfare because the two sides dug in around Hong. So there are all of these battles. They finally broke through in July, from June the 6th. They finally took Khan. There's Bradley and Patton. And now, 
Montgomery combined very bold speech that how he's going to break through <coughs> with this very cautious action and self-delusional leadership. Bradley now had the problem of conducting an offensive through the Normandy hedgerows or bocage that had never been planned. Well, what is that? There's the hedgerows. Well, what is, what is the bocage or what we call hedgerows? Well, it's defined as a pleasant shaded woodland. These are thousand-year-old growth, 50 miles deep behind the Normandy coast. Here is an overview. See, instead of fences, the farmers, starting in Roman times, had built these hedgerows to keep their cows in the pastures. Well, this is what it looks like. I took this picture on one of my trips. Uh, small fields, hundreds of them. Uh, you have a, a hedgerow with a base three to six feet. Hawthorn, brambles, trees growing to 20 feet. Here now is how we were fighting in them. They didn't have the equipment. They didn't have the training. And there was no way they were going to make a rapid breakthrough. And they very, they had to uh, fight only a few yards at a time. The Germans called it a dirty bush war. And they were used to fighting in terrain defensively. They learned many of these troops had been in Russia, and they used that. And Hitler ordered them to dig in. He also ordered his pan panzer units to dig in. They, fought, they were fighting a battle of attrition, in other words, which they were going to lose in the long term. And of course, the British couldn't fight a battle of attrition because they were running out of troops. On the 18th, the U.S. 9th and, uh, 9th and 19th Infantry and 82nd Airborne, they finally did break through across and isolate Shorber. Here's the peninsula. They finally did break through. Okay? But it took them a hell of a long time and many casualties. Meanwhile, how were all these supplies being brought in? Well, they had the mulberry, the artificial harbors. The mulberry, the first mulberry, was not invented for Normandy. It actually was invented during the First World War, and the first one was deployed in Singapore. They floated, the British floated one all the way to Singapore. Of course, it didn't help Singapore much. That fell to the Japanese, if you remember. But they used this for both the American and British beaches. The LST that you have here came up to these artificial harbors. They landed 29 tons of supplies, 58,000 vehicles, 34,000 troops. Unfortunately, on the 19th to the 22nd was a storm that was a winter storm that destroyed the, the American mulberry and they couldn't use it and they repaired the British one. And beyond doubt it was the most complete and intensive and best planned storm that Hitler could have ever had. And instead, what occurred was that the Allies now, whoops, let's go back, let's go back. The Allies now had to come up with a new way to land troops and supplies. And what did they do? Well, your LST sitting not far from here was one of those vessels that rolled up right on the beach. Though, at first, uh, it really did slow down the landing of, of equipment. But after... Uh, one month they had landed by the end of June, a million men, 200,000 vehicles, and 700,000 tons of supplies by using the LST on the beach. Now in the meantime, the Allies did attack and take Schorberg, but the Germans completely demolished beyond the most complete, intensive, and best planned demolition job in history. That's what Admiral Ramsey called it. The port was useless. It was not open until late September. And by then, the Allied front was far, far from Normandy, so it was basically useless for their needs. So by the end of June, a stalemate had developed. Rundstedt wanted to retreat and regroup beyond the Seine. Hitler absolutely refused to do this. The Allied casualties had reached levels now approaching World War I <coughs> casualties on the Western Front. The, the soldiers were stacked up like cordwood on the beaches. They couldn't land more troops and supplies because the, the bridgehead was too small. They needed to land more troops. 
They did advance to St. Lo, and finally, on July the 18th, they captured St. Lo. Of course, there wasn't much of it left by the time they got there. The St. Lo offensive and the, uh, the breakout that they needed only moved the Allied line about seven miles, and it cost the Americans 40,000 casualties in the process. So this was simply not acceptable. Well, all right. In the meantime, where's Patton? Well, Patton's in the doghouse. Why is he in the doghouse? Well, what he did in Sicily, he almost was sent home. Then they put him in command of this mythological first U.S. Army, and he made some speeches that outraged some, uh, some people, and that almost again got him fired. However, what he was doing in the meantime was organizing his plan to break out of the bridgehead because he saw how the Allies were bogged down. And he said the problem was Patton was pushing all along the line. Instead, he should hit a, a narrow front with tanks and armored infantry and using air power to break through. He called that plan Opus One. He sent the plan in writing to Bradley and Eisenhower. And Patton said he didn't care who got the credit as long as you let me carry it out. Well, Patton, Bradley unveiled his plan on July 11th, very similar, because Bradley was sitting now, oh, there's Patton's plan, his idea, and that's basically what happened. And Bradley was sitting, after suffering these huge casualties, with this endless hedgerow maze. Now, a Sergeant Curtis Curl of the Second Armored Reconnaissance came up with a new idea. They take welded steel scraps and put them on the front of the Sherman tanks because the Sherman tanks couldn't break through the hedgerows. But with these, these razor here, in fact, here's what it looked like, on the bottom, they could undermine the hedgerow and break through. And they did this and they equipped thousands of tanks with this for the, the breakout. Bradley's a Cobra attack attacked along a narrow 6,000 yard front. The 9th Air Force and then the uh, B-17 and Liberators of the 8th Air Force bombed a corridor four miles wide, two miles deep. They dropped 2,000 tons of high explosives and 25,000 tons of fragmentation bombs on the Germans. And at the same time, some of those bombs fell short and they caused uh, 490 men to be killed. They wiped out a headquarters of the 9th Infantry Division and they killed a General McNair, who was the commander of the U.S. Army Ground Forces, to friendly fire. So, did Cobra work? How did they do it? Well, first of all, you can see you can see the tanks, how they've broken through. All right. You can see it did work. But there was the other factor, and that is what? The Americans used their own blitzkrieg. They used the bombing, and at the same time, they then brought up armor and mechanized infantry together. Armor, again, without infantry is not going to work because they're too vulnerable. On the 25th of July, they attacked. The Americans, by the 27th, Rundstedt had been replaced by Field Marshal von Kluge, and he said the Americans were running wild. Now, they advanced all down this coastal road. Here's where they bombed, and or here along this line, and they then advanced all the way down. This is Mont Saint Michel. How many of you have been to Mont Saint Michel? Right, it's a beautiful church on the, north, on the coast. This was the key to the entire breakout. Once they reached here, then they broke out into France, into Bay of Biscay, and then also to the west. On August the 1st, 1944, was high noon for George Patton and the Third Army. His Third Army strode on the stage of history. His 4th and 6th Armored Divisions thrust them to the west. 
you can see at the base into Brittany to take those ports. And they also moved ultimately to the east to ultimately, as we'll talk in just a moment, bring about a uh, catastrophic attack on the remnants of the German army. Before Sicily, before that slapping, Patton was the clear winner. But I kept him because he said that he had to have Patton for the breakout through France, and he was right. Well, why was Patton so effective? You know, did he just get on top of a tank and shout, charge? No. Patton actually was a very detailed, intelligent, intellectual man that hid behind this facade of blood and guts. He saw this big battlefield picture. He discerned primary objectives miles ahead of the front. He planned these warp drives, capitalized on the mobility of his tanks. He used small-scale Michelin maps to map out the exact routes for these tanks, the roads, the forests, the bridges. He memorized these details. While in England, he studied the invasion routes. In the field, he carried a special 10 by 20 waterproof map. All the features were marked with secret codes. He had radio in his headquarters with code numbers for unit action. His leapfrog tactics were simple. The troops advanced, they encountered opposition, they left troops to hold that, and they would flank it and go around it. And he would leapfrog over and over again. He also had something called his household cavalry, which provided him with intelligence. They were equipped with jeeps, armored car, and radio sets, and they ranged far and wide across the whole front. He knew more about what was going on in the front than any other commander, including Eisenhower or Bradley. Benton was often the best informed commander. Another key component was the use, the success of the innovation developed by uh, Car uh, Crusada and his his. Uh, Ninth Tactical Air Force. He would use the Thunderbolts. There's Casada. He'd use the Thunderbolts. The Third Army tanks had a VHS radio. They could call down a squadron of P-47s. And within 15 minutes, they could blast a German defensive position. Patton's lightning advance smashed the German opposition's ability to hold defensive positions. He glorified in this success. He wrote to his wife, we're having the loveliest battle you ever saw. In the meantime, Hitler's back in Berlin musing about Patton's advance. He said, just look at that crazy cowboy general. He's going south into Brittany, and he's going along over a single bridge. One bridge, whoops. Hit it too hard. One bridge deployed all those. So what did our dear friend Adolf do? He took all the panzers that had been holding the British back and he deployed them against the, that spot. He was going to cut the Americans, wipe out Benton's army, and then march the coast and throw the Americans back into the sea. Of course, um, all those Four Panzer divisions had a combined strength of only 145 tanks because they were all had been badly beaten up by the Americans by that point. And the attack was stopped dead by Allied air forces and also by troops on the ground. It was the first time in which a land offensive mainly was stopped by Allied air power. But Hitler helped to create this pocket because now Here's, here are the, here's the British coming down from the north very slowly. And here's Patton swinging up. And this is what's left of the British 7th Army. And now he's just pushed more of his forces deeper and deeper into this pocket called the Falaise Pocket, the Falaise Gap. On August 8th, Bradley and, I, uh, and Eisenhower saw this, and so did Patton. And they wanted. Montgomery to come down from the north and Patton to come up from the south and then the bag would be 250,000 Germans. In fact, most of what was left of the German army in France. 
So they did it. And Patton, on August the 12th, came through Argentine on the south. And he was only six miles from Falaise. There were very few Germans between him and the Canadians. And then at the 11th hour and 59th minute, Eisenhower, Montgomery, and Bradley stopped him. And they said, no, the, the, the Canadians have to come down and close the gap. The gap didn't close to the 20th of August. This was probably the greatest missed opportunity of the Second World War. It could have dramatically shortened the war. Now, the Germans did lose tremendous amounts of equipment in the Falaise Gap. The equipment of 15 divisions was almost totally lost. However, the Allied victory was strategic. It was not, it was not strategic, I'm sorry, because the Germans were able to continue the war. Here are the estimates of how many Germans escaped. The, the Allies said 50,000 escaped, but look at all those estimates. We believe, based on our study of this, and the ability of the Germans to reorganize these divisions to fight the Battle of the Bulge, 200,000 Germans escaped. If they had been encircled at that time, the war in Europe probably could have ended in the fall of 1944 and not in May of 1945. As a result, half a million more Allied casualties would not have occurred. Allied prisoners of war would not have died on those death marches. All of those Jews would not have died on the camps. Russia was not even in Poland at that point in 1944. So much of Eastern Europe would not have fallen under the Soviet sway. This was one of the great mistakes of the war. At the same time, shortly thereafter, was the liberation of Paris. Now, the, British, the Allies did not want to liberate Paris. They did not want to liberate Paris simply because uh, they'd have to give the rations and the gasoline, and uh, they were trying to sustain their offensive. This is de Gaulle marching down the Champs-Élysées. For political purposes, we allowed the French, with our help, to liberate Paris. A few days later, de Gaulle was afraid of losing control because he was not the elected president of France. There were socialists and communists and others that were opposed. So he asked for troops to reinforce his presence. That is the 28th Infantry Division marching down the Champs-Élysées. I interviewed a man on his 100th birthday who was in the middle of that group. I asked him, what were the people like? And he said they were so happy after four and a half years of being under the Nazi boot. They were elated, they were ecstatic. And he said, uh, and the guys on both sides, on the long curb, they got food and wine, and the girls were hugging and kissing them, and he didn't get anything, and he was really ticked off. <laughs> in the meantime, Patton had, had advanced 400 miles in 26 days. On the 18th, Eisenhower approved Patton's drive to France. On the 18th, Eisenhower approved Patton's drive to go into Germany. I'm sorry, into Germany. Patton said, I never have given a damn what the enemy was going to do or where he was, because I've always gotten to the place he expected me to come three days before he even got there. His army was far ahead of all the other Allied armies. On the 20th, he estimated he had breached the German West Wall in 10 days. His troops were closing in on Metz. The German general staff wrote at that time, there are no German forces behind the Rhine. Our front is wide open. Marshall observed, now look at Patton. He's out of the doghouse. Look at him go. And Patton's West Wall target where he was going to attack, the Siegfried Line, was empty of German troops. There was no one to stop him. His advance to the Moselle area, there was only five undermanned German divisions between him and the Rhine. And he wrote, we're having a hell of a war. That was, here was his plan, to cross the Rhine, take Frankfurt, and then advance up to the German industrial zone of the Ruhr, and then to Berlin. That was Patton's great plan. On August 29th, there were only 100 German tanks and 570 German planes defending the West. 
That's all there was. The Germans on the spot termed the situation an ignominious route, route, I'm sorry. And the Germans were surrendering, and the ones that didn't have white flags were waving chickens. They were so interested in surrendering. Well, the British objected because they said Rommel, Patton had had his turn, and now it was, that's right, Montgomery's turn to do it. And he pleaded the case to Eisenhower. He wanted a full, there's his plan, a full-blooded thrust in the north. Patton was to be halted. Why? They didn't have the gas. Remember Ramsey said they had to have a port? Remember Ramsey said they had to have Antwerp or they couldn't invade Germany? Well, guess what? Yes, they had, they, they had set up the Red Ball Express, but those, those trucks were using up more fuel than they were delivering to the tanks. They did not have enough to invade Germany. So all of the suppliers would go to him and he would march to Berlin. Well, Eisenhower told Bradley and Patton, he took back his agreement to let Patton go. Because he had a third plan. Here it is. Oops, sorry. Here, here it is. If I can get the machine to run. Oh, there we go. We've got it. All right. And this was, the original plan was, the, the British would come from the north, Patton and others would come from the south, and they'd encircle the Ruhr, and the two armies jointly would attack to it. The problem is they didn't have the, the logistics to do it. Remember I said to you, logistics was the Achilles heel of this operation. Ramsey had warned them repeatedly, and he was pleading this case with Eisenhower. They didn't listen to him. So, Patton Montgomery was given the gas, and uh, except for gasoline that Patton captured, he was stopped. And for once, for once, Brant, he, he uh, made a rapid advance, 250 miles in six days. My God, that's the fastest he ever ran. I'm talking now about our dear friend Montgomery. He, he, got, he was so fast that he took Antwerp Harbor. That's a picture of Antwerp Harbor intact. The Germans didn't have time to blow it up, thanks to the rapidity of the British advance and to the Belgian underground. But there's a problem with this. Let's go back. Here's Antwerp. It's an inland port. There are all these islands here called the Scheldt Estuary. Instead of taking those islands, he didn't. He continued his advance. Well, the Germans were still stuck on the coast. There were still troops there around Paddy Calais. Rundstedt moved them all onto those islands. So now instead of opening that port and letting the ships come in, they were ready. That port that would not open until the end of November. So he advanced, and he also had sold Eisenhower on the idea of market garden, this huge airborne assault, the largest in history. More soldiers died in Market Garden than on D-Day. 6,000 casualties. The British 1st Airborne Division basically wiped out. The Polish Airborne Brigade destroyed. And the Germans now had no supplies, and they were stopped all along the border. So let's go back now and quickly give you the crisis in command. Overlord remained a great dazzling, organized, advanced technology feat. It was essential, obviously, for the defeat of Europe. Montgomery was a rogue commander. He undermined Allied operations at Falaise and elsewhere. He wanted to receive the credit for being the victorious commander. And if you read Divided on D-Day, you will see how many times he and the other British commanders attempted to get uh, Eisenhower sacked and put him in charge. His egotism and lack of tact triggered resentment even among many of his fellow Brits. 
Eisenhower allowed his role as arbitrator to overshadow his responsibilities as supreme commander. He held the alliance together, and that no one else could do. He did a great job of doing that. But he failed to use his authority to rein in rebellious subordinates. Bradley was a debatable commander, but he waited too long to involve Patton in Normandy. And then he erred in stopping Patton at the Fellies Gap. Patton was the maverick, the grandstander. His lapse of judgment in Sicily caused him to be sidelined when he was most needed. He was not the commander of the U.S. ground forces. If he had been so, he would have had direct contact with Eisenhower, and things might have worked out differently. But alas, he did not. Patton was America's best offensive general in the field during the entire war. Ramsey was an affable commander. He did get along with all of these men, and his amphibious assault plan was flawless. His advice on logistics and the importance of opening Antwerp were ignored too late that it stalled the entire campaign and delayed the war going into 1945. So what are the top lessons we can learn from this overlord campaign? Number one, victory is won by the side that makes the fewest mistakes. We made many. The Germans had Adolf Hitler that helped to weigh down on their side. They never recovered from that. Overlord was necessary for the Allied victory. The Russian army and bombing was important, but it would not have guaranteed Germany's defeat. Overlord attained most of its objectives by vanquishing the majority of German troops in Europe, liberating those nations, and advancing almost to Berlin. The division among the Allied commanders, though, was very significant on D-Day and throughout the campaign. The third, we believe that the strategy of speed and mobility that we saw used by Patton, if it had been employed before and after August of 44, the feudal battles of Arnhem, the Hardigan Forest, the Battle of the Bulge, they never would have occurred. Unresolved crisis in command were among the factors that prolonged the war in Europe for another nine months and estimated another half million casualties. After the war, Patton summed it up. The Allies won the war the wrong way. They were too slow. The bottom line, the Allied leaders could and should have done better. In 1964, Eisenhower visited Omaha Beach, but he gave us this final lesson that I don't think we have still learned here in the 21st century. These men came here, British, our allies, Americans, to storm these beaches for one purpose only, not to gain anything for ourselves, not to fulfill any ambition America had for conquest, but to preserve the freedom of ordinary people. Many thousands of men have died for such ideals. These young boys were cut off in the prime of life. I devoutly hope that we will never again have to see such scenes as these. I think, I hope and pray, that humanity have learned we must find a way to gain peace, eternal peace for this world and to delay the tyranny of each generation as it arises. A vital lesson that we still have not learned. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we have time, I think, for some questions. And I have my associate here with a mic. So let him come first. Why don't we start out right here in front? And then we'll get to the back, don't worry. Why were the Canadians held back? Or why were the Americans held back at that critical time when the Canadians were told to go? And I don't remember the exact battle, but it was early in the invasion period. When the, American, when the Americans were coming from the southwest and going... And the Canadians were coming from the north the, because yeah. they were fighting against the German cancer units. The Canadian Army had been increased, like ours, dramatically. They had a very small army and a very tiny officer corps. And many of their officers were not very well trained. They performed much better as the war went on. But Montgomery grew inexperienced Canadian troops and held back seasoned British troops in reserve, who probably could have broken 
and close that gap. And he didn't do it. All right. Again, it was a mistake that Montgomery made. Look, Montgomery was not a bad general. He was a good general in many ways, but he should never have been the British Crown Commander. And he should never have been involved with overall command. That was a big mistake that Eisenhower made way before that this was at the end of 1943, he asked him to do it. Because he felt inadequate because he had never led troops. Yes, in the back. Well, Rama was forced to commit suicide was because of his failure to stop the Allies? No. He was implicated in the assassination plot to kill Hitler. And they found out about it. And they came, he had been severely wounded by a British fighter plane scraping his staff car. And he was in Germany recuperating at home. And they came and offered him a choice. He could go with him, them and commit suicide, or they put his son and wife in a concentration camp and kill him. And he'd get a ludicrous trial before a people's court, and they'd kill him anyway. So he took the hard, the hard way out. And they never, no one really knew that. I have a German friend who was a professor of mine was a little boy then who knew Manfred Rommel. They were in school together. Manfred was Rommel's son. And they marched in Rommel's funeral parade in Ulm. Ulm is where Einstein was born as boy. And Ulm is where Rommel was buried. I've seen Rommel's grave. So no, they, that's why Rommel uh, had been wounded and then uh, implicated and Hitler killed a lot of people from that assassination. Next question. Yes. Oh, what did they do with the German dead? And did they take any prisoners? And where did they go? Next year, this leads right into something I wanted to talk about anyway. I will lead a tour for the 75th anniversary of Normandy to the Palm Springs Air Museum. This will be a 10 day tour. Uh, it is organized by a travel agency, but people who come in from all over the United States, starts in Paris and then goes uh, through Normandy to Mount Saint-Michel, will go to also um, Chartres Cathedral and in Paris. In Normandy is a, a, a huge German cemetery, and there are buried seven people. Underneath each iron cross, there's a huge iron cross at the front of the cemetery, and then all these smaller iron crosses. Remember, 75% of all the casualties in the German army in World War II were on the Russian front, right, in the east. There is a foundation, it has nothing to do with the government, but runs all those cemeteries. So, that's, uh, the, you know, the Germans lost hundreds of thousands of men because of Hitler's stupidity to fight this war of attrition. And they did stop us. I mean, those, they were very tenacious fighters. And we, we took prisoners. Oh yes, we took we took many prisoners. Where were they taken? Uh, to England or back here? They came back here. Yes, they came back to the United States. And some were in Canada. If you ever go to the Canadian Rockies, have any of you ever gone to the Canadian Rockies and and uh, driven the ice field <coughs> the ice field parkway that suddenly went dead? The ice field parkway. There's a monument there to all of the Italian and German prisoners of war that helped build that parkway. Oh, they helped build that parkway. Okay, any other questions? Is there any truth to the story I heard that Eisenhower was chosen as the Supreme Commander because of his name, the German name? No. In fact, uh, initially they were going to have Marshall become the Supreme Commander. And he was, and Eisenhower was going back to Washington to become the chairman of the chiefs of staff of the army. All right, they were gonna trade jobs. And in the end, Roosevelt would not let Marshall go because he had to deal with people like Admiral King and MacArthur and all these other prima donnas. And he felt that Marshall was the only one that could, could work with them. Now, Eisenhower was very good. Look, Eisenhower had a hell of a job. He had to deal with Churchill, De Gaulle, on all of these arrogant Brits who thought Americans were uh, novices at war, and then all the American generals who were constantly bitching that the British were getting more than the Americans. So he had a terrible job. So he made mistakes, but 
If you read the diaries of the commanders, they all admit that there was no one else that could have done what Eisenhower did. Now, the other thing was Alexander had been the commander in chief in the Mediterranean. Montgomery was the commander of the North Army, but Alexander was the commander in chief of the British forces, all right? And Eisenhower was the supreme commander. Eisenhower wanted Alexander because they got along very well. And Alexander would have been appointed, but Churchill got pneumonia after one of these big four meetings. And he was at Marrakesh when they made the choice back in Britain. And some of the Brits didn't want Alexander because he came from a noble family. And they, the socialists objected to that. And therefore, he was not instead. Um, and then uh, you should also know that the fact that Montgomery was the head of the 8th Army at El Alamein was a pure accident. The, the general that was chosen when Churchill went down to North Africa, they had just lost Tobruk, which was a huge, big base. And, they were, and Churchill was afraid that his government would fall. All right? And so he fired Augenreich, and he appointed another general. And Churchill was there, and this other general went to the front in Churchill's plane. Well, the Germans found out, and they shot down the plane. They thought they were going to shoot down Churchill. They killed him. And now, well, who else can we get? And they were going to use, they were going to use Montgomery to command the British armies for torch, okay? Not for, for so the, the, the choosing of Montgomery was an accident that was compounded many times after that run of war accidents. Yes, uh, maybe one more question, is that all right? Yes. You said that uh, Eisenhower was a colonel when he first came in? Yes. yes. How fast? And he ended up as a five star general, four star general, didn't he? Yeah. Is that what point? They, they, all, they all were colonels. Remember, in 1939, the United States Army was the 17th largest army in the, in the world. Argentina had a bigger army. Now, Paraguay had a bigger army than we did. All right? So uh, we expanded our army. Tremendously. Remember, after World War I, what happened to the Army? It was greatly reduced. And what happened after World War II? Our Army was greatly reduced. Why did we have a struggle in Korea? Why do I inter I interviewed an Air Force general who commanded a wing in Korea, Air Force uh, Jetman, and he said he lost many of his men because they were flying condemned National Guard jets that flamed out and crashed in, in, in Korea. This is earlier in the war. So after every war, we have tended to make drastic cuts to the military. And then who suffers? The, our troops in the next war. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to your point. Well, I, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the RFD TV. They, had a show, they have a show on on Friday called Texas Country Reporter. Well, in this town in Texas, I can remember names, but there's a lot of German POWs were brought to this town. And they interviewed a guy that stayed here, he was a German, stayed here, and he went to work for one of the local ranchers or farmers. He now runs the ranch, and I mean, he's just been here forever. It was a lead. There were many Germans who did not want to go back to Germany. Right. right. And then, the, and, and there were also hard Nazis who would execute and, and kill Germans who didn't want to go back to Germany, all right? So it was a very mixed bag, all right? Oh, it is. It's fascinating. A little right. plug for the museum. On our first floor, we have an exhibit that addresses this very topic of prisoners of war, different types of camps. So our members can come by and watch that any time that they would like. But it is something every time I show it to groups, they go, huh, I didn't realize we had prisoner of war camps right here in Michigan. So I invite you to come back and do that. Thank you so much for, for You're very welcome. speaking to us. I'm and, gonna, I, and I'll be downstairs now. And I'm going to ask before you guys go, we'll let him go downstairs. He's going to be at a table signing books. We have books available for purchase. After he's gone through, since he can go first, uh, everybody else can go down and have your book signed. And maybe while he's making his way down, would you, Professor Maniatis or Professor Troutman care to remind everybody what's happening tomorrow? We're doing a little time travel tonight. We went to the past. Tomorrow we're going to the future. This man's got you covered everywhere, right? <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
there is a presentation at the college on future jobs. Now you know that right now we have over 9 million jobs in this country we cannot find qualified workers for. Why? What's going on? Suddenly we don't have any people that want to work? What's going on? So there's alignment of skills and things that need to happen. And we need to revamp not only our education systems, but maybe our business systems to boot. And uh, Ed has written some books, called a book called Future Jobs, where he's addressed this issue. He's been looking at this for over about a 10 year period. And he's been working with various communities across the country, places in South Dakota, Iowa, Illinois, and other places, to start looking at this comprehensively. How do we get the youth of the future in the right careers and the right career paths so they can have good, sustainable employment? Not $10 an hour, you know, dead-end careers. Careers that have good wages, good career tracks, trajectories for the future. So if you're an employer, a business person, just a person that's interested, or a student, we invite you to come and listen. Now this is an outgrowth of a cooperative of a new group called the Muskegon Think Tank. The Muskegon Think Tank is comprised of people from industry, business, education, and the political sector as well as labor unions. For the first time we are talking as a collaborative as to how to go about this. Drop all the old titles, the silos, start working together. Because if we don't get on board, Muskegon will be in the backwash. We won't be able to catch up. The careers of tomorrow require thinking of today. And we've got to get aboard. And our young people, as well as our workers who need retraining, need to be there. We need to get people going. So it's an issue that many of us have great feeling about. We welcome you to come, listen, and participate. There's going to be a lot of things that we're going to be discussing tomorrow evening, 6 o'clock. And if you're a business leader or a political leader or involved in labor, come at 2. We'd like to have you. There will be some selective meetings throughout the day with various constituents. Ed's going to be meeting all around town. He'll be going around, looking around. He's trying to help us get ourselves together. So we welcome you again. Tomorrow's evening's program is free. Starts at 6 p.m. Room 1100 in the Stevenson Center on the MCC main campus. So if you are interested, you want to hear about the future, what we, we need to do, this is a great time to come together and, and hear it. Okay. We thank you tonight for coming. I mean, it was really good to see all of you. Stop by, see Ed, pick up his book. If you're interested in some of this stuff, this is the kind of, the kind of stuff you need to pick up. And next week, there's a lecture I gather. What's the lecture? We're about the Cold War next week with Ron Oh, Colonel Ron Janowski returning for the Cold War. He's a, per, per, uh, he's a perpetual favorite out here. So. Please come on out. All right, good evening.